The advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. For your specific situation, you will need to get in contact with your local OT, vehicle modifier or mobility dealer and set yourself up with an assessment or a trial. Trials really do put you in the driver's seat, so get out there and get one going. Before we get started, we just want to do a quick shout out to our sponsors who make this show possible, Mobility Engineering, Driving Well and Williams OT. This show takes time and money to put together and we are forever grateful for their passion for our industry. Okay, enough of the business. Let's get on to the interview with Jenny and Brad. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Drive Able podcast. I'm Jenny Gribben from Driving Well Occupational Therapy, and here with me is my trusted co host, Brad Williams from Williams OT in Adelaide. How are you, Brad? Yeah, I'm really, really, really well uh, excited about this interview. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about car racing as a double uh, lower limb amputee. Um, so we have a fellow called Travis who experienced an accident several years ago, but he is here today to share his story about how he's actually returned to driving from an everyday point of view, but also back to you know his passion of um, hobby car racing. Driving fast, yeah. driving fast with hand controls, I believe it is, and um, I think there's going to be a lot of people that connect with this episode. We actually interviewed uh, Todd Hazelwood, who's a very, this is before your time, Jenny, uh, who's a passionate uh, advocate for road safety, and he's a V8 supercar driver, and, and we we're talking about some of the things to get into um, driving fast and driving around tracks and mm. and talking to him about his passion about getting yeah. off of the road and onto a track and now we're going to hear i think from somebody with a disability that actually does that in real life and uh and and makes that uh hobby of his uh into a real passion and 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 taking it to the next level and i think um you know his his story is just from what like what he's been able to achieve is is pretty incredible so i think he's he's going to have a really wonderful story to share um that a lot of people will um get something out of so let's get into it shall we let's do it mobility engineering is australia's leading automotive product supplier for disability customers we have installers all across the country over a hundred of them and we have the largest range of mobility products for vehicles in the country. Get in touch with Mobility Engineering for any of your driving solutions. So hi everyone, uh, uh, back for another episode of the Drive Able podcast. We are here today with Travis Dion Knox uh, from Brisbane and we are very excited to um, talk with him about his experience in getting back to driving with vehicle mods. How are you Travis? I'm good, thank you. That's good. good Starts of the day. Can we can we start off with you um, telling us a bit about yourself? Um, yep. Yeah. So I'm obviously from Brisbane. Um, some would say middle aged man now. Um, had my accident <laughs> approximately four years ago. Uh, serious, obviously, motor vehicle accident um, involving someone else that wasn't so savoury. Um, I woke up in hospital. I can't remember exactly the amount of days, but I, I was in ICU for nine days at the beginning. Woke up, um, tried to stand up. That doesn't work because I'm now double amputee. So mm. both legs above knee and below knee. Um, I'm just a normal guy that likes to do stuff. I came out quite lucky. I didn't have any brain injuries. I did have a brain, I did have a brain bleed and I had a few things that had to happen, but my cognitive and everything kind of came back to where it should be so I've been very humbled by that side of it and I now work as a therapy assistant with other people with brain injuries um, that was an opportunity that was brought to me through working with people that helped me to do um, things around the house that I was unable to do at the beginning and also do a little bit of consultant work for disability network in Queensland here so um, yeah life's been pretty good I can't really um complain i'm sure we'll get into the driving side of it but that's personally me uh dogs house normal life yeah just minus the legs a lot of wheelchairs and a little bit of prosthetics yeah 
what was life like before the accident? Let's just go and paint a picture about where was um, life up to for you before before the accident? Um, pre-accident, again, no complaints. Uh, apart from I was I had my accident in 2020, so it was in COVID. Yeah. It was right around the very serious part of COVID. Um, I was actually due to go back to work that next day and um, was going for a drive, heading out to uh, a local track here. Um, it used to be a drift park. So if you're into cars, you know, there's drifting and racing, etc. cetera. Uh, never got there, obviously, um, with the altercation with this person. Mm -hmm. This person also left me on the side of the road. So mm -hmm. that was an interesting side of it. Um, I only knew about this through the police reports, obviously, months later, because I was in obviously in hospital for about four months total. Um, yeah, pre-accident, I was driving trucks. I was a chef, qualified chef, but um, a friend of mine got married into a trucking company and I always got, I was very over the chefing world. Mm -hmm. So he got me a job driving trucks and it was probably one of the best jobs I ever had. Just got paid to sit in a car, in a truck with another guy and talk and drive for eight hours a day. And I was more than happy. Good money. Helped fund my um, car hobbies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, standard stuff, you know, lived a uh, very normal life but obviously it was leading up to COVID so there was a lot of downtime you know you, know, you weren't allowed to do it and none of us were allowed to do much given give or take so um yeah and woke up one day on the other side but yeah tell us about the car hobbies side of things because that becomes you know that's a real big part of your your history and identity and background and like we as occupational yeah. therapists we love to talk about occupations which is you know the things that you need and love yep. to do in your life I always and, loved yeah sorry You're and right. that's I know that's been a big part of your return to driving journey as well <coughs> yeah so I was into I was actually racing cars hobby but obviously I was funded my funding myself and I was really like um you know, I'd work my ass off just to get more money, to spend more money on a car. <laughs> Everyone always made the joke. It's a better hobby than crack and prostitutes. So, um, you know, it's a quite expensive world when you're building the car yourself. Um, but it is very attainable for the normal person. I just wanted to be, I'm very egotistic when it comes to competitive things. I always want to be better and better and better. So it was an easy drive for me just to keep spending money but also there's the other side of it because spending the money doesn't actually make you faster it's the experience and actually being a good driver so there was a trade-off between both sides um i'd had started out like every guy that's into cars with your standard everyone wants a loud fast car and then i met a few people that were actually i found they were racing their cars like uh, hobby out of queensland raceway here um which is just a local track if you're not from brisbane um and the first time I went out there, that was it. That's all I wanted to do. Like, I just could not wait to get, you know, putting the helmet on and wearing a driver's suit and attaching yourself to a car. And that whole feeling is just unattainable anywhere else for me. And also it takes it off the street, which is always that growing up thing. Everyone loves the ego side of it, but it's not really... Once you go on the track and you realize just how fast people are that are fast, you realize just how stupid it is on the street and how insane it is on the track because, you know, you're in a safe environment. It's like a placebo effect, you know. It takes away all those other things and you're just worried about one thing, going fast. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I got right into that. I started out with a, a car that won't make any sense to you, but it was a Kia Mentor with a Mazda Familia engine in it, so an engine swap, normal car with a rally engine from another country, quite common in New Zealand. Um, I broke, broke that like 10 times, learned to change my own gearboxes because it was so expensive to keep fixing it. Um, and then I moved on to like real cars, like a Honda S2000, uh, Nissan 180SX, and ended up with an S15 Nissan Silvia. So along the same lines, all Japanese cars. But um, yeah, they were just, you know, when you look, you like to look back at your cars, kind of, you know, you bought the right one. Well, I fucking loved my cars. I just could not. Yeah, everything was about. It was just like a, uh, it was an easy out. You know what I mean? Like you get in your car and you go for a drive and it was just mm -hmm. relaxing. But then taking it to the track was also nervous, but, you know, you get to do that next level with it. So, um, 
Yeah, I was Being kind of hooked. Coaching or anything like that and training or and, and all your mechanical knowledge. Is that all so I can, yeah, I connected with a local uh, mechanic here. Um, awesome guy. He was like a second dad is the way I'd explain it. Um, mm -hmm. He had massive knowledge, grew up in like the Peter Brock era, things like that. So he knew his cars. Everyone knew, everyone knows him in the scene and he was super helpful, but super honest. Um, and I used to spend a lot of time there. Like the same thing again, like a good mechanic almost comes like a second home. You know, you're welcome to go there. They'll have like Christmas drinks or, you, you know, you come down, you just sort of, you spend more time talking than working. That's sometimes, I think that's why mechanics take so long to fix your car because <laughs> they do a lot of uh, better banter in the background. That's no disrespect to them. They do an amazing job, but he taught me a lot and, I still talk to him now. I still do the same things with him um, just on a different level, obviously, because I'm a lot more hobby now than I was serious, but mm. he would, um, the mechanic that worked there would come to the track. And once you get into the serious side of it, I had a, a particular ECU in my car, which logs data. And then we used to run through the data on the laptop and he'd be able to tell me things that make no sense to me, just graphs and angles. And he's like, you know, you're breaking here. You can break there. This is, it was really, really cool stuff. And, I think in your industry, you'd understand that data is probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with racing cars. Um, the data doesn't lie. So it tells you what <clears throat> you can and can't do because um, you get obviously multiple layers of data from one track and they're like, well, this is faster, this is slower. You're going faster here. You should be going faster there. And then you take that onto the track and um, yeah, those sorts of relationships with people that are in the industry really changed my drive. Really? Were you racing, 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 like with other no, cars around time you? Attack. Or were you doing time and time track? Time yep. attack, yeah. I couldn't, yeah. Uh, obviously, racing in in grids is another level. Mm -hmm. Also, it's another bank, another bank balance. Yeah, um, if you there's live that, that risk of getting knocked and banged and panels. Bigger. and Exactly, yeah. Kind of it's stuff, a constant, yeah. um, like definitely racing is, if you want to be honest, it's more of a rich man's hobby and I'm not a rich man. <laughs> but you can do time attack at your own pace. And yeah. you can race your own times and you can improve and be really happy with what you're doing. I used to race with a guy that came out in with his air conditioner on in a brand, normal Mazda 2, had the greatest time of his life. I couldn't see the excitement in it, but he loved it. So, uh, yeah, each to their own. So time attack is just where you go out on the track, basically 100 meters apart in your, your groups are all around the same speed. So there's less overtaking and you just want to push to get your best lap. It's just like a time trial. So. Then it, it, I don't know about you, but my mate's completely into this. But he, um, you know, he's got a little, uh, uh, was it Peugeot, little Peugeot that he's bought, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, done it up as best he possibly could, and uh, the same type of thing. Um, he's he's madly into it, and I just nod my head. I I, I yeah. don't I don't get it, but I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, but I, I can see that passion in him as well that I can see in in you and it. Yeah, you know, once you start talking about it, I can I can hear exactly the same passion coming out in in my mate as well, and it's it seems to be a cultural thing. So you were you were deeply into that at the at the time of of the accident. Yep. Talk talk to us about talk to us about can can you unpack? Are you able to unpack the accident for us and and what those yeah. first early stages were like? Uh, waking up, you've touched on it. You you realize yeah. that your legs. Didn't I work, mean, but can you unpack it a bit more for us? Yeah, I'm not overly uncomfortable with the accident uh, information. I'm more interested in like you know just how amazing doctors are and what they did for me mm. and where I am. Um, so I was a person involved had an accident. I avoided them, and avoiding them, I put my car into a power pole. Now I was in my S15 at the time, so it has a half cage in it, so it has a lot of modifications. That's what saved my life because where it hit the power pole, the roll cage stayed intact, but my legs got crushed. Mm. Um, obviously, it was a pretty heavy impact. Um, again, we can't show pictures on here, but we're talking like an absolutely destroyed car. They had to cut the roof off to get me out because I was stuck. Mm. They cut one of my legs off in the car to get wow. me out because it was stuck. It was completely crushed. Um, my are other you, leg. Are you conscious at this point? Are you? Are you? I was supposedly saying particular things but i'm not i have no memory of this at all my whole yeah. accident probably the first two weeks even hospital i'm sure we'll touch on that was a little bit my memories are more fantasy than they are reality mm -hmm. um 
yeah, so one leg was cut off in the car. The other leg was in the passenger seat. So mm -hmm. my leg was completely snapped. Um, I was wherever I was. They cut the roof off and pulled me out. I had, uh, I died when they pulled me out of the car. So I have my first cardiac arrest there. Um, mm -hmm. When they put me on the gurney, the police officer said that she thought they put me on the gurney on my stomach because my legs and my body was so mangled. It looked like I was face down. Mm -hmm. um, she said it was just like one of the most, um, you know, it was really uncomfortable to mm -hmm. see um, this thing come, well, this person come out of a car in the shape they were. Um, so then they obviously, I got tourniquets on my legs because they've cut one off. Um, you know, the ambulance people were absolutely amazing. And then I had another cardiac arrest in the ambulance on the way to hospital. So I was a DOA on arrival. Um, and then I was revived. And basically that then goes into what they did in hospital. I could only imagine the next 24, 48 hours. Um, wow. Had a second amputation, obviously, because the other leg was destroyed. Mm -hmm. um like the photo i've got a photo of my ct scan my mri sorry and it's just my legs are in like 40 pieces mm -hmm. like we're talking like absolute destruction mm -hmm. broke obviously with the roll cage being as good as it is it's not really designed exactly for street so it is legal everything about my car was legal but obviously it's not a hitting an airbag it's like hitting a solid metal thing so i broke all my eight ribs i broke my shoulder hit my head um that's where the brain bleed came into it um, in that, obviously, dying, I threw up in my lungs, so mm -hmm. I had to evacuate that. And then I had, obviously, infection on my lungs, so I had pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a metal rod in my right leg because that was actually snapped in half as well, mm -hmm. so impact of hitting the power pole. Mm -hmm. um, I basically destroyed my body <laughs> in a way that um, was quite confronting to the people around me, not mm -hmm. so much for myself, as I said, because I... Um, I just woke up in hospital, woke up one day, didn't know where I was. There's no connection to the accident. So this is quite a, like psychologically speaking, it's quite common to have like a um, mm -hmm. adverse reaction. And when I woke up in hospital, I was um, just me. I was like, I don't know what you guys are doing. I'm getting, I'm about to get up and push. Mm -hmm. You know, I was quite vocal. I'm pretty, you know, strong headed person. And a lady grabbed me and got on my chest with her hands, like right next to the bed. And just said, Travis, you've got no legs. And in which most people would probably be quite overwhelmed. I just went into the, I must have been abducted and I'm on a spaceship and they're harvesting my body. Like I was high on drugs. I was yeah. just in another world. Um, and then it instantly went into the, okay, I had to figure out how to get out of here. Um, and that's all I really remember on those first, that was probably in the first three days. Um, yeah, again, I'll stress this mostly was painful for people around me. Um, not for myself because mm. I don't have any, I have no recollection of speed or crashing. Um, all my hospital memories are just crazy trying to escape. I, I don't know what's going on here. They're harvesting my body. Mm. Why are they taking all my blood? You know, um, it's very clinical. You know what I mean? Like it's a clean, mm. busy, but very quiet. Ster ICU is very organized. Obviously, obviously it should be because they're saving people's lives. And yeah, and I just remember going in for operations. I think I had seven operations in the first nine days. So just fixing things that were broken constantly. And I had two, three amputations. So my right leg was amputated in the car. Mm -hmm. My left leg was originally amputated first <clears throat> entrance to the hospital. And then third day, I had to amputate my knee because it was too damaged to save. And hence why I became an above knee and a below knee. Mm -hmm. That's basically the rundown of um, what mm -hmm. happened, yeah. So, so you've got us to the point of you know waking up thinking you're being abducted by aliens. Yeah. But um, let's let's skip past day three. What was rehab like? What was the rehab journey? What? How did you? Did you? So, did you aim aim to walk straight away? Did you? What was oh, what was going through? One hundred percent. Um, once I became let's say copus mentis. So obviously you're very drugged up, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. you're you're completely being kept alive. Um, for that first period um, you're not aware like I remember asking for water like you know and they give me like the sponge because I wasn't allowed to have anything because of operations because mm -hmm. of the process that was going on but I'm not aware of any of this I'm just like trying to survive yeah like mm -hmm. the only thing I can think of that makes me feel comfortable is water so at least I can get water that's something I can connect with someone because I'm not talking to people I'm not doing anything I'm just strapped to 
I've got shit all over me. That's basically keeping me alive. Um, I've got no photos because um, I just people were around me that were like, it wasn't really something they thought it was worth taking photos of because it's, you know, for your mental health. Um, it's not a memory that you want to keep. Um, rehab was interesting, not so much for my stage of it because I was actually quite able once I was um, Copus Mentis, like I was aware. <laughs> But I was in a ward with a gentleman that had been crushed in a silo. Um, I was in a ward with an old guy that was, um, he wasn't 100% there. So he was a bit dementia-y. You know, he was on drugs too. So he was a bit like, he thought we'd been taken from the Ruby Princess, from the first, the boat that originally had um, COVID, the first COVID. Mm -hmm. So he was like, oh, we're all an experiment. And this is this is that. And and it's feeding into my anxiety. So I'm in like a, an award where I can see uh, the Gabba at the PA there. It's the Gabba, yeah? The local. I'm just asking Jenny because I always I get it wrong. So. Yeah, it's the Gabba. <laughs> but I didn't know if it was just uh, TV screens to make me feel like I was in yeah. Brisbane when I could have been yeah. in a spaceship above fucking Brisbane, you know? Yeah. Uh, being. So, yeah, it's a bit of a – and then watching other people struggle was probably the hardest because I was so incapacitated. Um, mm. but also wasn't because the gentleman that was crushed in the silo on a farm, he couldn't use his arms and stuff. So, you know, you got, you got like five grown men in one room and most of us are pretty bad and we all got our limitations and, you know, we, we can't go to the toilet. It's, it's quite, it's just a very, uh, I'm a very, I think post accident, I may have not been beforehand, but very empathetic and it's just, grown with me and seeing people struggle i remember like breaking down in the hospital and the nurse asking me what's wrong and i'm just fucking swearing my ass off like why is no one fucking helping him why can't anyone just look can't you see struggling like this is and um it was yeah it was really confronting and it also was quite humbling for me because i realized just how okay i was yeah. um i mean i was through as everyone's like oh you know it's insane what's going on i'm like yeah but not really that bad like if you could see what's going on in here yeah. not that the hospital is like this crazy ward where everyone's just you know struggling but just those particular people around me mm. gave me a lot of perspective and I still talk to um Critter today who's the guy across from me um yeah he just had basically his whole body reconstructed mm. and uh he had is stories that of, is that the silo, the silo guy? Guy. Yeah, and as you said, like he was aware, so he's got memories of the chopper coming in, and he said it was almost like oh, watching man. a horror movie where they had because they had to airlift him from the farm back to the PA, and he said just listening to that whoop of the helicopter when it was coming in, it almost felt like it was a slow motion horror movie, and he's in there drowning on grain, mm -hmm. and it's like okay, fuck, I just woke yeah. up, <laughs> I just turned up here, you know what I mean? Like I don't have any traumatic, you know, six hour journey in the car where i'm getting cut out and mm. i've been really lucky that my memory i mean that's also the way we work yeah like we do Thanks, block us. out yeah we protect us but i have learned post accident as well a lot about vicarious trauma which is another mm. interesting thing i work with people that have had car accidents and sometimes it really affects me but i'm like don't really have a connection to it but my body does because mm. i lived through all these experience even though i don't mm. remember it my brain has sucked it up and mm relates to it so yeah that's hospital really um everyone's really good I, I appreciate i'm super humbled by the people in the hospital i know everyone talks about different hospitals saying oh this is good this is shit and no one wants to be in hospital because it's basically where you go to die realistically mm -hmm. like you, you don't go to the hospital because you're in a good place um and it does feel like that it's very sanitary it's very uh methodical but i am um, they saved my life and they fucking gave a shit and they did all the things that needed to be done. And, um, you know, I've and got, you, you know, what did the, what did that look like? The, the going home part from possible, like the rehab and, and getting back home. So I actually wanted to, and... yeah. So I was in COVID obviously. Yeah. Um, so the visitation was like one person for an hour. No people with children. My cat keeps me out. I'm just going to open, let her out. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a um, – I didn't really connect with it again because I think everyone was going through it. And, like, I don't have children and things like that, so people were really being blocked out of their ability to meet their – see their children and things like that. And, yeah, okay, I could only have one visitor for one hour. 
hospital was boring as hell let's be real you mm -hmm. just wake up and you do what you need to do but you're not doing anything because you're completely screwed like mm -hmm. i couldn't go to the bathroom i couldn't shower i started to look absolutely terrible and um uh, a person in my life was like, you know, can someone give him a shower? Can we get him a haircut? You can tell he's like really down, like mentally. He's like mm -hmm. struggling with it. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know too much, but I did see it when they um, they brought me in some clothes so I didn't have to wear a gown because you're in this gown. Um, mm -hmm. Just trying to connect to the real world, I think, mm -hmm. for me was very important. Um, even the blanket, they brought me in a blanket because I hated the hospital blanket because it felt so clinical. And that kind of relaxed me and helped me just, you know, comfort. A little bit of comfort. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of life. Um, so I was in the PA here in Brisbane. I ended up, uh, once I get out of ICU, they put you in a ward, which is kind of like your intermittent before you end up in the rehab. Because mm -hmm. I was obviously going to rehab. I just had to get there to the point where I was able to. Mm -hmm. You don't really know your limitations until, like, you start to realize that, yeah, like I can't take a shit without someone helping me get there. And I, I cannot shower at all. So um, I, I laid on my back for like the first two months because I just couldn't lay any other weight with my legs. They were just so painful, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You got to remember I'm attached stuff. I'm, I'm more completely wrapped up. Um, the first three weeks, I think I had drains hanging out of my legs, which I don't have any memory of, but they have to drain the fluid from the fresh amputations. And there's bruising, obviously, the trauma through the roof because it's all been amputated um, traumatically rather than yeah. let's do this because of a medical reason. This is just let's cut this thing off in a car. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a huge process for the people around me. Again, my friend actually said that my leg looked like when you go get cryovac meat from the shop and you want to buy a steak, you could see like straight in my leg with the bone and everything. And said it was, I don't have any connection, but I could imagine that would be pretty um, scarring for people mm -hmm. around me. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll stress that hospital was more traumatic for people in your life than it is for you because you do get the, the comfort of the drugs and, uh, you know, you're not really doing anything, whereas everyone else is just looking at you. And I was an extremely active, active person. Mm. Um, sport was everything it wasn't just racing cars like I'd wakeboard and I'd skate and mm. surfing and you know if you had wheels I was probably gonna have a crack at it um, mm -hmm. being it's all taken away from me now it hasn't really affected me but I'll be honest I'd love to have my legs I'm not going to pretend that this is the great life that I'm and I'm not making it out to be but life has got two sides and anyone that sits there and says oh yeah I'm, I, it's fine where I am well, that's bullshit like no one wants to wake up an amputee or paralyzed or with a brain injury. Yeah. It's not a negative because it's a hard, it's hard. It's not negative, not positive. It's not fair to dismiss your previous life and say, oh, I'm a better person now. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think I'm a better person because it makes you grow. Trauma is really interesting in the way that it makes you realize a lot of things, um, the smaller things, but I think as people, we take advantage of the world. We mm -hmm. always really just, it is what it is. But post-accident, I was I hadn't been outside. This is the easiest one for me. I hadn't seen the moon, hadn't seen the stars for three months. Mm. And, um, yeah, it was really heavy the first time. Mm. So those sorts of things make you start to take a, a realisation. Uh, I'm going to change. Yeah, no, go. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think my uh, internet's a little bit slow here, so sorry if I'm a bit paused. But I want to take it to the point where you – you're talking about the moon and the and the heaviness of it sinking in. When did driving become a thought for you? I know you had a lot going on, but yeah, some I'm people sorry. it's really early, some people it's really late. When was driving, uh, especially with your background of racing, when was driving a thought that popped into your head and then when you realise, shit, I haven't got any legs? Mm, um, yeah. When did when did this kind of when did these thoughts happen for you? So when I was in rehab in Bunya, which is the rehabilitation unit in um, the PA here for people with my particular types of injuries, um, I was in there with another gentleman who was across from me who was just like, a, he had ADHD, I swear. Like he would be the type of person that would wake you up at three in the morning because he couldn't sleep. And it was like, I don't care that he didn't care. He'd like slide across the ground and, you know, tug on your bed sheets and shit. Anyone else would be completely annoyed, but he was just quality for me because he kept me like going mm -hmm. um we were talking about 
getting back into random things, you know, just hanging out and stuff like that. And we just went on, um, we were Googling stuff. Like, you know how you do? You just randomly look things up because it's the only way you really have an attachment. And I found some pretty random, um, like driving stuff, you know, like not just driving, but driving like professional race car drivers that have had manification drifters that use their feet. And I kind of went into this originally with, oh, well, I'll get back to walking. I'll get back to driving. I'll get back to walking. Sorry. Like I'm on stilts. No big deal. I'll just fucking knock it out. That obviously didn't happen. You realize that things take longer, mm -hmm. but the driving seems really accessible because, um, you know, you use your hands. Um, there's definitely technology out there now i did source some bit more serious hand controls for myself or at least i looked into it because but the original thought was basically when i was coming home so probably three two to two and a half three months into my injury but obviously you gotta you can't count the first two months as really anything for you to think about stuff because you're just surviving yeah you're just given a you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow i actually thought i was going to be in hospital for like a year I just figured I'd still be there. Like so much rehabilitation, so much, um, you know, new skills to learn. Mm. Um, because I was so mentally able, again, I didn't have a brain injury. All those little things came back really quick because mm. I didn't have any, like, I can't do this. I can't do that. I was like, well, when can I do it? So yeah, in the first three months, definitely. Um, so it was in yeah. the first three months that you, you yeah, know, close to when I, that there were options to return to driving. Yeah, so I have a really good um, insurance. Um, can I? I don't know the. Can I mention the company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So NISQ connected with me post accident, mm -hmm. and once they started talking to me and uh, you know telling me that we're going to help you with this, we're going to help you with that, I was very okay. I didn't realize this existed. I didn't know this happened. I thought I'd go home and be given like a dolly you know, or a skateboard, that was basically, I didn't realize there was anything that would help you get back into the world. Yeah. Um, and once that was the connection, then that's when things really started to change for me. Um, so for our, our listeners, so Travis is um, under the National Injury Insurance Scheme of Queensland yeah. um, but because of his serious injuries with his double um, amputations that he qualified I guess <laughs> you don't want yeah. to qualify for these insurances but you did um yeah and, that... yeah and they have um a really strong support plan and case management system and I guess hooked you up with all of the referrals yeah. and support yeah I think they were they did something that like okay, coming out of my accident as I said I was very headstrong it didn't matter that I was I didn't give a shit that I was given anything I didn't expect to be given anything because I didn't realize that there was any place to be given anything for an accident mm -hmm. I thought that was just this is my life now yeah. like I was happy I lived in Australia um and then when I started talking to obviously they have a support planner mm -hmm. basically that connects with you at the beginning and it was like look we're gonna we got to come out to your house. We're going to connect with you on that. We're wheelchair. We need to help you organize the wheelchair. That's going to benefit you and prosthetics as well. Mm -hmm. And that's when they were talking about, um, you know, driving. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, so I can get help driving. I didn't realize you could get funding for things like this. And they were like, oh, of course. And that was like, okay, then is there anything I need to do? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like when you have car insurance, you know, you got to pay for it. And I was like, no, this is what we do here in Australia. This is what we do here in Queensland. And I was just like, okay. Uh, and then it started with the house, like just signing a, because obviously owning my house um, was a lot easier because I'm not renting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, they rebuilt my bathroom so that I could get in there with a wheelchair. When originally I was fine, just I'll get off my wheelchair and I'll slide in on my ass and then someone mm -hmm. will help me get on the toilet. Now I'm obviously very able, but at the time I couldn't even pick up like a Coke can at the beginning. I had no strength. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so the driving thing, as you know, um, when I found out I could get it, it was almost the first thing that I wanted. Um, did some driving tests. I had my accident in May. Mm -hmm. I was probably home by September and I had my hand controls in my car before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And it changed my life. And I mean that in like the biggest way because you're so unable to help yourself when you can't drive. And I'm not a massive fan on taxis and buses. And also in a wheelchair for the first time in my life, mm. you don't really want to get in buses and taxis. And, mm. um, and once I was got my hand controls, it was independence. I could do absolutely anything I wanted. And I mean, I could go up 
local mountain run in my car. You know what I mean? I could do all the things I used to do because it's an equalizer. Yeah. Cause when you got no legs, you can't do a lot of things, but swimming and driving are two very equalizing mm. parts of your life because water gives you that buoyancy that you can enjoy mm. and driving. I can drive just like anyone else. Mm. So it takes me a bit longer to get in and out of the car, but um, I can still do what you do. So <laughs> what are your, um? so what does your mods look like? So I use the fatty oil. What process did you do with? So I did a few driving tests. Yeah. Yep. I can mention company, yeah. Adaptive. I can't mention names. Adaptive Mobility. Yeah. Well, I connected with you first through Sean. Sorry. Um, I connected with you first through NISQ. um, And you were just on it straight away uh we got straight on to a local company here and then i was doing testing in their adaptive car now they had different types of hand controls Mm. but i'd already done my own research online and i knew what i wanted because Mm. i'd seen other people use it and they had it and they're like yeah we can have it we can test it on that i went out for my first drive it's literally i use a fatty or hand controller so you have a brake pedal that is like hand so it just pushes the pedal down it's like got a cable uh, a rod connected to it but the accelerator is a bluetooth module that sits on your hand so you basically press your thumb that's your throttle so it just takes satellite accelerator satellite satellite accelerator yeah and i did one drive and i was ready to go i said well can i get my license now and they're like, no, it doesn't work like that. And I was like, well, <laughs> it's just like playing a video game, but you sit in the in the vehicle. And I mean, I played a lot of video games in my life, so it was really easy connection for me. I was told by originally that this isn't the most common one because it's a little bit more complicated. But for someone that's younger, this is the easiest one because you're just literally used to using your hands in a way that's like a video game. I know that's probably a bad analogy, but that's exactly what it feels like. Uh, it just came natural. But because of logistics i had to do six driving lessons with um the driving instructor and then um yeah i think we tried to connect after that and the car didn't work because the hand controller was turned into the wrong switch so that to drive me back but you were aware that i could drive and you knew the situation worked and then yeah by christmas so it was the quickest turnaround ever and i just that was it. I could go to physio on my own. I could go to prosthetic appointments on my own. I could go to hospital appointments on my own. I could go to the shop. Um, I could go and buy a coffee from a shop. You know, these little things that may not seem like that big a deal. First time you can go to the shop and buy your own coffee when you're a double amputee is fucking amazing. Um, It just changes your perspective. Your independence is so important to anyone that's able. And as an amputee or a disabled person, it's a huge win when you gain a little bit of it mm. and yeah that was it um i um, if you continue with the driving i always had a psychologist which i think is a super important part for anyone going through some form of trauma you do learn a lot um even though you go in with a little bit of a it is what it is sort of mentality you start to learn that it's okay to actually care it's okay to be you know down it's um mm. not always going to be so straightforward And we talked about racing cars. And originally I said, I do want to get back into racing, but only as a hobby. Mm. It did take about, let's just say, three years Mm. to actually get organized. But I've started racing this year. And I am first session was very anxiety driven, Mm. very heavy, but also because you like different car, different time, different everything. But I had the experience. So I was always really like, hey, let's just go from the beginning. Um, and now I race every month. I'm doing the full time attack series. I'm doing the full sprint series. Um, the bank account is struggling, but that's what comes <laughs> with it. Cause the first thing I did was need new things. So um, what car are you using for racing? I use, so I have a little hatchback. It's a RS 200 Renault Clio. So in the hatchback world, it's just that turbo front wheel drive. Oh, in the post- oh, yeah, I was going to say, the Peugeot is actually in the same yeah. division as me, as far yeah. as I'm aware. Yeah. So yeah, um, what some would say, for me, I was very much like it's it's downgraded from what I used to race. But as mm-hmm. I've been driving it, it's not at all. It's just different. You start to learn that, again, spending a lot of money doesn't make you a fast driver. It's practice. And this was all new for me. First front-wheel drive car. Mm-hmm. First, I mean, first hatchback. Um uh, it's been, I absolutely love it. Like I said, I've 
I don't know if I told you, well, I just bought a second car because I managed to get a second car because this is now getting way more serious and Mm -hmm. I don't want to drive it every day. So, you know, sticky rubber suspension, it's really not the most comfortable car to drive on the street anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. You just get this, if it's something you're into, you get like this, it's not a bug. You just get this mentality towards it. You're like, okay, I must do better. The whole goal is always go faster. So you just start (laughs) fucking making it. Yeah, less and less streetable. I need to I need to go back a bit. So yeah. were you racing the car that was funded to start off with, with the hand controls and things like that? Or did you get a second yeah, so, car to fund a second car? No, so the way it worked was when I came out of hospital, I needed a new car, obviously. Um, yeah. My insurance paid out on my accident because it was not my fault. Um, after there's a few police reports, obviously, they had to go through it because it was such a serious thing. But in the end, they said, yeah, let's just do this so i had a little bit of money um but i didn't actually intend on being anywhere near as serious i used to be before so i was looking for something that was i could put a wheelchair in because i didn't i don't have lifts or anything i just all hand everything because i don't want anything hanging off of anything um bought the reno because it was a decent price it ticked all the boxes and if i wanted to do some form of track it was capable it just as it is you know i could just go to the track and have some fun so it's pretty much I, a year road car yeah exactly it was just my normal car to start yeah. with but i had the ability to do other things if i wanted to and um that's why the first few years has just been rehabilitation physiotherapy mm-hmm. blah 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 but then this year um i was considering going back to the track but one of the rules was to put a half cage in it so mm-hmm. I have no problem with modifying cars as you're probably already aware. So I was like, yeah, for sure. I'll do that. Even if I don't, it looks cool. And I like the idea, but as soon as I did it, that was kind of it. It was like, well, got a half cage in the car now. Yeah. Let's, um, so we kind of started down there. Um, NISQ would have funded me if I had another car, they would have helped me with hand controls because it was, something I was interested in. It was my hobby. It was part of my life. I'm not just coming out of the blue and saying, Hey, I want multiple cars with hand controls, <laughs> but there was a bit of a gray area with me because the car I had already, I wanted to put on the track. So I kind of did it the other way around. Mm-hmm. I've bought a second car and they've helped me with the hand controls. Cause that's now my daily car. Mm-hmm. And they kind of flipped this one into the track car, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah. NISCU again, have been absolutely phenomenal for me because like everyone, we're all individual. And no one's story is going to be the same as the next person's. So just because it doesn't work for someone doesn't mean it's not going to work for the next person. And I'm pretty happy to do a six page email just to explain why I want to do something and give you reasons. And they've, that's why they let me do it. So yeah, I've managed to get my daily car. The Renault now lives next to the house, gets driven to the track once a month. You know, I'll, I'll take it out every fortnight just because I can still drive it on the street, but one day it'll be unregistered. It'll be, gutted but i don't want to um obviously have a friend that's into this i don't want to move up division yet so i'm keeping the car as standard as i can this year Mm -hmm. but next year we could go to the moon if you know what i mean Mm -hmm. yeah so and what's your road car now i have a holden commodore ute the greatest thing i've ever bought (laughs) i love it so much it's just a normal car with no modifications uh it's a ute so i throw anything i want in there you know, you can run tip runs. That's the other thing with driving and has given me, a, the rig, originally it was always help. You need so much help for just the littlest of things. And now I will just literally throw half my house in the back, go to a tip run. People kind of look at you funny when you get out of the tip in a wheelchair and then you slide up into the back of a tray and you're just ripping stuff out, trying to do your best and you're covered in, you know, dirt and dust and stuff. But I mean, that's the ability that comes with it. Yeah. Like, you get to do the things that, I mean, a tip run may sound quite normal, but someone in a wheelchair with, you know, awesome. 200 kilos of shit in the back of their ute, that's cool, I think. Um, no, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's absolutely um, awesome. And why we love doing this podcast, because it is, it's stories like those that, I don't know about you, Jenny, make our job, you oh, know, okay. so it's worthwhile. Just, um, yeah. this those is little yeah little the little gold nuggets uh the little things like a tip run yeah. um or there's, getting there's onto some, a track or getting a coffee for the very first time 
yeah. those were first goals. Like when they asked me about my goals in the hospital, um, a few of them were very simple. Like I want to see out the sky. I want to, cause you don't know, you really don't know if you're going to live. Yeah. You're very mm-hmm. fucked up. Um, mm-hmm. And mentally you're very uncomfortable because you just almost feel like this is the norm. So it was like, make a cup of tea, go outside, uh, sleep in my bed, mm-hmm. uh, see my dogs. Like when you really break down the logistics of what life's about when you've gone through some trauma, I think. Um, don't wish trauma on anyone, but it does really make you reevaluate things. Mm-hmm. But again, with my level now of what I can do, it's still the little things. Like mm-hmm. I said, driving to the shops to get fucking one that I do regularly is that after dinner, we'll go get a McFlurry from McDonald's. <laughs> I can drive and go get McFlurries. And I, I mean, you know, it's a drive through It's simple, but I can do that. Whereas at one point in my life, I couldn't. I couldn't do mm-hmm. anything. And um, yeah, driving really opened up the world for me. One thing I do struggle with is washing my own car. Won't lie, mm-hmm. going to a drive, uh, drive in washing and in the wheelchair, you can't get no like, but that's nothing to do. But I've tried, mm. so that's the other thing you get to do. Oh, I'll have an attempt at least, I can be part of this, but yeah, washing your car sucks in a wheelchair, mm. can't, can't get on the roof. Can't get on the roof. So, yeah. do, you, do you do the automatic ones like where they've got the brushes I, go um, the top and all that kind of stuff? But with a ute, it gets a bit trickier, yeah. Um, again, thing another great thing about NISQ is they actually fund me a car wash every month mm. so yeah. it's because of the reality of it there's a few things that are just not logical um you can do your best but you shouldn't have to just do your best if you can't perform then they're willing if you can't get the job done then why should you suffer just because you've had an accident so they're willing to help so yeah because I was into cars they give me a car wash every month so I just alternate the cars okay um, yeah nice and simple but yeah and are there any other um yeah you're talking about the goals being really small to start off with and then you know as you sort of okay hit that goal what's the next goal what's the next set of goals what's yeah so walking obviously the racing was huge the racing has been a really good mental health thing for me it's actually been a bit of a um cast 22 on that one because as my psychologist exchange explains once you still once you get quite I have a very competitive mentality and racing a car is very, it's either just too far or it's not enough. So to go as fast as you can, it's always just next to failing. If that makes sense, you know, the faster you go, you want to use the whole track, but if you use too much track, then you crash. So as a person with an injury and obviously there's a little bit of like anxiety and, you know, there's mental slides that come to this. She said, I picked a bit of a, bit of a uh, fine line sport to get back into because mm-hmm. it could come with, trauma that you know can set you back but i mean we can't change who we are uh let's let's be realistic but getting back on the horse right like exactly yeah like um it's yeah i mean i'm not personally i know i can go faster but also i'm happy with the way that my ability is growing with time Mm -hmm. and racing's not your only the only hobby that you mentioned you know before accident you mentioned wakeboarding surfing skating yeah a lot of those things I don't connect with the way I used to because I can never take away the fact that I don't have legs now I know that they do do adaptive versions of a lot of these sports Mm -hmm. I have been involved like uh, I've been to the wake park um Mm -hmm. I've actually started doing other things like uh mountain biking um Mm -hmm. I got an adaptive mountain bike absolutely phenomenal one of the coolest things again because it's very inclusive Apart from jumping over 60 gaps, I can do everything that you can do on the mountain bike, especially with this mountain bike. It's a very high-end piece of equipment. Whereas wakeboarding will never be the same for me. Like mm-hmm. I can't just hit a kicker and go flying through the air and then land on my feet. One, because I feel like if I did that on my ass, because they're seated, I'd probably break my back and I just don't really have the connection with it like I used to. It's I'm very detached. Mm-hmm. from that those sorts of sports not detached enough not to try them just not i did it you know what i mean Thanks. i did it all the time yeah, yeah it's not the same it's never going to be the same and no matter how much you want to tell me yeah we can do it adaptively it's yeah. not gonna tick yeah. that box but there's plenty of other options that i've evolved into so yeah but the driving yeah. gets really close to how it was is that the difference 100 percent. um with the driving for example in queensland here with i'm only in street tuned but i'm coming second in my group of about eight cars and i'm like well that's 
being a positive and a negative because I was at the bottom, then I'd be like, cool, I'm just getting used to it. I'm having some fun. But because I'm doing well, I'm like, well, I can go faster now. So I have to go faster. <laughs> so that's where I, you know, buy suspension and bigger brakes. Yeah. And... But that's nothing to do with your injury now, though. No, that's no, no, at all. You that's being just a competitive beast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I think that's the thing. There's no getting back in the car and racing it was. I wasn't I wasn't treated any differently. Like you're just another person that goes to the track. I mean, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. People love to have a chat. How do you drive? Mm -hmm. But you're not like um with disability comes a lot of um stigma. Mm -hmm. And I don't really get it. I've always been around good people, but you do see it in public. You know, people will get out your way, people will wait for no reason, people will like let you go past in lines and things. It just comes with that you need help. Whereas at the track, it's like, well. I'm almost like I'm cheating because I've got weight reduction because I've had my legs removed. So, oh, you know what I mean? That it's right. like a, is that yeah, what yeah, yeah. I got the people like you know, because that's what it is. Once you get serious, you know, people start talking about all like the little things and the bits and pieces that you can do. And it was just a joke, and that's funny. I think it's true. It's, it makes me laugh. Um, I'm sure they're like, more interested in the technical side of it as, as well. Yeah, like, they, they always things actually work. They love the control controls everyone loves the controls because most people that are into that sort of thing are very like they're all like backyard engineers or backyard mechanics you know what i mean so they're always like oh that's fucking crazy oh, that's so cool mm -hmm. and like you can still do all the things that i'm like yeah i can still you know hold the steering wheel with two hands and accelerate i can use the gears yeah. um yeah i have to take one hand off for the brake but you know i can trail brake for example with the hand controls that you've put in so mine are designed that you can still accelerate and brake at the same time which is a little bit different to the standard mm -hmm. setup mm -hmm. but they can do that for you if you're the right person that's what yeah. i mean like adaptively the sky's the limit really for anyone what to if, get back into things yeah do you have any advice for like if there's people out there that are listening that have had an injury or you know looking to get back to driving like do you have any advice around you know what to expect how to navigate, and how yeah. To navigate it yeah um Research. i think a, a lot of it can begin to do with the people around you and that's not a disrespectful thing, but it's really helpful when you have a strong support group. And that can be shit for some people. Like I've had nothing but great OTs. I've had nothing but great support coordinators. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard stories of other people that just have trash, that mm -hmm. just do not stand up or do the right thing. The people around me have been, again, it's probably it's put me in a weird perspective, but I had a support worker that would come to my prosthetics and say, no, you should be getting this, your, and they did the research. So it's, yeah, I really would say if you have someone that's not meeting your standards, mm -hmm. even as a disabled person, like be aware that you're worth more than nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting something, talk to someone, say this person isn't giving me, then they don't care. And if they're like, oh, they're, they're just learning and shit. It's like, fuck man i'm learning as well you know what i mean and i should be talking to a professional i shouldn't be meeting someone that's doing what i'm doing i should be talking to someone that's like this is where we should be going this is what you should be doing i'm helping you navigate this a little bit more because mm. it is you go in blind mm. everything about disability or adaptive sports or adaptive you know mm. world is new for you unless you've grown up in it which no one none of us should have ever grown up in that so mm. it should be um I think, and also don't be afraid to do your, do your own research, mm, ask yeah. questions. Um, I think no one would have pushed the Fadio satellite hand control on me unless I'd done research to look for it. And that's not against anyone in the industry. It's just that it's not the most common, but it's not the more, or well, now it's probably a bit more common. I think yeah. I find a few people that are using it, but at the time when I did it, I didn't know anyone else that was looking at it. That wasn't even what was over rings were directed towards me, um, mm. things like that. And I'm like, okay, can I try this? Mm. Um, yeah, you can't ever data, yeah, your own research, your own information. Take some notes, mm. write some things down. Usually mm. I just jot things down and then I'll say, hey, have you heard of this? Mm. And they'll be like, oh, yes. Or they'll be like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay, can you look into it? Because it's something I'm interested in. Mm. Yeah, don't be afraid to give a shit about yourself if no one else will. Yeah. Really great advice. And it's not the first time it's come up that 
yeah, do do your research, ask your questions. Mm. And the other thing is that's come up before is you you've been in a in a fortunate boat with people that have helped you out and had the knowledge to help you. Uh, but seek a second opinion if you're not happy and, and ask for somebody mm. different if you're not happy for sure. Hey, it's been a wonderful conversation. I really thank you for sharing your experiences. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some people out here that get excited by this. And, and even if they've never really raced it before, um, because it's so uh, equalizing, they might want to ha actually have a go. But before we wind up and ask you our very final questions, mm. uh, we're just going to hear from our sponsors that make this show possible. Williams Occupational Therapy focus their attention on helping people with their mobility needs. From driving to wheelchairs, Williams OT provides help to get people mobile. Hey Travis, we have learned over this podcast that cars are more than just getting from A to B and you've mentioned so many memories already and I really want to thank you uh, for that from the coffee and, and, and all kinds of memories that you've shared. <laughs> But are there, is there another specific memory that you can actually identify that means so much to you and it's more than just going from uh, going from home to going to an appointment? What What's mm. a memory for you that stands out and why driving is so meaningful? Um, look, I, there's, as I would mention before, there's probably 10,000 of these for me because it's always been something that I'm really passionate about. I just enjoy driving. Good mm. music, you know what I mean? Cruising around. Um I think post accident, the best feeling, which is exactly why I'm having this conversation with you, was very much like the first time I ever got into the early stages of performance cars when I was enjoying turbo and stuff like that. When I first got into my first car that was good, you get on the highway and you drive it along and like you just have this like sensation of like the engine, the turbo noises, the, you know, the, the actual sensation that comes with it and you're just so happy you're like this is all i want to do when i first got in my car on my own after mm -hmm. my accident and i was able to drive and i was driving to prosthetics which is on the gateway i accelerated onto the highway um you know with my finger and the windows are down and i'm just completely in control of everything and nothing matters. It's just so good. Like there's no one helping me. I'm as equal as the next person. And it's one of those like giant smiles, just looking out the window, like a kid in a candy shop. Yeah. You just look like an absolute cheesy. Yeah. It's just so fucking cool. Like, mm -hmm. and you pull up at your prosthetic appointment. Um, it's the whole trip. That first trip um, was very, because I was only just beginning to go through prosthetics seriously. Mm -hmm. I got my driving before I got my legs sorted yeah. um, again, because of the freedom side of it that comes with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you pull up at prosthetics and it takes you 15 minutes to get out of the car. Cause you're still learning everything and you bang in the mirror with the wheelchair and you know, you get all your shit together and it's your first time to do something on your own properly. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Like that was huge. I mean, like now I could talk to you about doing a 60 round sprint track or 62 to be honest because i'm not that fast yet but um <laughs> those goals are actually super when you start to feel like you're going where you used to like that you know i'm doing well like i'm not just ang anxiously driving the track i'm starting to push for all these bits and pieces to get my times better but yeah it's the first day of driving a car on your own um once you're given your license is fucking cool um and you're allowed to live yeah <laughs> I think it's a great but way. Drive, to driving it, right? is you know? such a huge uh, part of life, yeah? Yeah. Oh, just... That's awesome. Thank Travis, you. That's thank you a so great much way to finish it For off. sharing your story, for being so honest and raw and authentic and vulnerable. Like there's there's so much that you touched on with, you know, your the actual accident, your cardiac arrest, your ICU, your rehab stay. But what you've been able to do is a testament to you and yeah it's just yeah i'm 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 tearing up right now so i want to apologize to all of our listeners who are in the car and they haven't gone into work yet or they haven't <laughs> gone inside yet because they've listened to your entire story this uh conversation's right. gone on for 
for longer than we expected, but it's been absolutely worth it, mate. Uh, thank awesome. you very, very much. Congratulations. I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Driving Well Occupational Therapy loves working with people of all ages and with all kinds of medical conditions to safely give them the opportunity to explore their driving goals. As we wind up this episode, please remember that the advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. For your specific situation, you will need to get in contact with your local OT, vehicle modifier or mobility dealer and set yourself up with an assessment or trial. Trials really do put you in that driver's seat. If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share a story about driving with a disability, or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes, or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.